Now listen, unless you're brand new around here, you've already heard me talk about microdosing many times before. But all sorts of people are microdosing to feel better, get more sleep, and to boost their mood. Now if you're anything like me, and you have a hard time falling asleep, microdosing can be a game changer. Our show today is sponsored by Microdose Gummies. Microdose Gummies deliver the perfect entry-level dose of THC to help you feel just the right amount of good. Now before you tense up over the fact that I mentioned THC, let me just say Microdose Gummies are legal everywhere in the United States. And these gummies are perfect for people who want to feel good without getting high from just one microdose. It's like finding the sweet spot between CBD and THC that gives you the benefits of both. A mood lift, greater sense of calm, and the ability to fall asleep with ease. Now these gummies also taste great, probably because they're made using high quality organic ingredients infused with Oregon grown berries. Now microdose is available nationwide. To learn more about microdosing THC, go to microdose.com and use code Monsters Among Us to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Links can be found in the show notes, but again, that's microdose.com and the code Monsters Among Us. Now, as always, supporting our sponsors supports the show, so thank you for listening. And back to tonight's hometown legends. Good evening and welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. Hi there, folks. And welcome to tonight's special episode. And boy, do I have a barn burner for all of you this evening. Our latest installment of the Hometown Legends series, and per usual... This episode is busting at the seams. But before I begin, a quick reminder that hometown legends typically stem from terrible, tragic events, and in turn, often, detail such atrocities. So what I'm trying to say here is that this is your trigger warning. Talk of murder, suicide, violence, and all-out terror lie ahead. Parents beware, and those with heart conditions You'll probably be all right. Now, if you're new to the program and this is your very first Hometown Legend episode, allow me to explain the concept. Every city, town, village, and hamlet has a local legend, folk tales, fibs, or real life occurrences that are unique to that specific area. A hometown legend, if you will. And we featured this series for two reasons. One, I enjoy learning of these fresh stories, along with the listeners. And two, it gives listeners that have yet to be blessed or cursed with their own paranormal experience an opportunity to participate in this program as well. And besides, it's always fun to shake things up a little. And shake things up, we shall. Beginning with tonight's hometown legend format. Now each season I try to come up with a unique way to present these legendary stories. And this season's grand finale is no exception. I began to notice a distinct pattern with these listener submitted legends. Just a few years back. You see nearly every entry fits into one of five categories. Deranged people. Serial killers. Mass murderers. Madmen. Then you have your treasure stories 
lost gold, pirate treasure, a buried train car full of plunder. Then you have your standard curses, Native American curses on stolen lands, you know, warlocks, voodoo, hoodoo, and quote unquote, devil worship. Then there are the ghostly entries, haunted places, people, and things. And if I'm honest, this one can really be divided up into two subcategories. You have your travel spirits, haunted roadways, bridges, trails, that sort of thing. And then you have your more traditional hauntings, like hotels, parks, and toy stores. Then of course, my favorite category, the monsters. Those beasts in the backwoods, and the creatures in the canyons, Bigfoot, Dogman, alien big cats, creatures that shouldn't be here but somehow seem to be. And so tonight we're going to dip from each of these categories with a couple small adjustments. I didn't receive any treasure stories, so sadly that grouping will not be represented this evening. And because I received so many ghostly stories, I'm going to go ahead and divide it up the way I just mentioned. Roadway versus static hauntings. So then, that's enough explanation for me. It's time for us to get started. So I present to you tonight's hometown legend contenders. Listen in if you dare. Keep your own tally and decide which category is tonight's spookiest. You determine what is real and what is imagined in tonight's season 14 finale episode. Hometown Legends number 14. And to kick us off this evening, we begin with Mara from just down the road, down in San Diego. Hi, Derek. I'm calling to submit a couple quick stories for the Hometown Legends episode. My name is Mara, and I grew up in San Diego, California, and I have a couple stories. They both took place in Old Town, San Diego. I have a lot of experiences, but these two stories happened more recently in my adulthood. The first story is when I took my son, he was about four years old, to the Whaley House. They were doing a discounted ticket price, so I decided to take him. I'd been there before when I was younger, but it was his first time, and obviously he was very young. So we were exploring the house. It has very creepy vibes. I'm not sure if you've been there. I know you've talked about it before, but anyone who's been there knows they do a good job keeping it historically accurate and keeping a lot of the original furniture and all these things. So there's a lot of creepy energy in the Whaley house already. And we had gone upstairs and we were pretty much done walking through the house. And as we turned to go down the staircase, my son, who again is four, stops at the top of the stairs and is refusing to come down. I'm already about maybe two steps down. So I turn around and I'm talking to him and I'm trying to convince him to come down the stairs because it's time to leave. And he points past me to the bottom of the stairs and says, I'm scared of that creepy lady. And I turn around and there's nobody there. And I'm convincing him to try to come down the stairs because again, we need to go. And now I'm starting to get nervous and he is straight up refusing to go down the stairs. So I finally convince him and hold his hand. Obviously he's very little and we walk down the stairs slowly. When we get to the bottom, there are no museum workers in sight. I ask him, what did the lady look like? He says she was wearing a green dress and had red hair. To me, in doing my own research, it sounds like maybe it could have been Miss Whaley. I'm not sure, but definitely as soon as he said that he was scared of the lady at the bottom of the stairs, I turned around and there was absolutely nobody there. And it was a pretty empty day because it was in the middle of the week. So there weren't a lot of people there. Again, the museum workers do dress up uh, in period clothing, but when we got to the bottom of the stairs, there was no one anywhere that I saw that was dressed that way. So that's the first story. My son still remembers it to this day, and I've told it many times. The second story, as I said, also takes place in Old Town San Diego, but it takes place at a different location. 
My husband and I, around Christmas time one year, stayed at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in the middle of Old Town San Diego. It's rumored to be haunted, but I, I honestly don't know as much about the hauntings there as I do the Whaley House. But anyways, this one's just a short, quick story. Definitely weird vibes at that hotel. And that night as I was sleeping, something fully yanked the sheets off of me. And I woke up because of it. And my husband was fast asleep snoring next to me. So it wasn't him. I did wake him up and ask. But again, he was completely asleep and the covers were yanked off of me. So thank you so much. We really enjoyed the podcast and are very excited as uh, avid Anza Borrego visitors for the documentary as well. And we hope to uh, hear this story on the podcast. Thank you. Bye. Ah, yes. An excellent place to begin tonight's journey. Thank you, Mara. Old Town San Diego is a charming little spot. It's a high-traffic, touristy area in the west end of town. Now, I've visited the place a few times, and I've even walked around the outside of the Whaley House. But unfortunately, I was not able to go inside. Which is a shame, because, as Mara said, the place is said to be very haunted, and apparently has been that way for a very long time. Here is a report from all the way back in 1984 via KFMB, CBS News 8, out of San Diego. The house has been around since 1856, built by a merchant named Thomas Whaley. Some people say Thomas Whaley still lives here, in spirit. The Whaley House is a museum now, and June Redding has been the director for almost 25 years, a very pleasant, very rational woman who is convinced the Whaley House is haunted. There is no doubt in your mind, is there, that there are spirits in this oh, house? Oh, definitely. I think they'll always be here. I don't believe that they're going to leave. I think they're tied to this house. Mm -hmm. She says the spirits are friendly. They never bother people. But she says they are present. The consensus is that there are four main spirits. Thomas Whaley, his wife Anna, a little girl who used to play with the Whaley children, and a sailor named Yankee Jim Robinson. Yankee Jim was hanged for stealing a boat in 1852, four years before the Whaley House even existed, but the gallows stood right here, where the downstairs archway of the house was later built. Now the director featured in that clip had been there since around 1960, and I imagine the stories persisted well before then. The history of the home goes a long way back, and so do the tales of ghosts and spirits. And like many of the places discussed this evening, you can actually visit this one for yourself. The Whaley House Museum offers tours daily, with tickets starting at about $15 apiece. Come early to enjoy the weather, and maybe pick up a taco or two. And thanks again, Mara, for sharing your entry. The perfect representative for the classic haunting category. Now from here, we venture all the way across the U.S. and beyond to the United Kingdom, where Jordan has tonight's first transportation-based entry. Hey Derek, my name is Jordan. I'm originally from Kentucky, but I live in England now, and I have a hometown legend for you in the town that I live in now. So it's called Maidstone. It's in the county of Kent. It's about 30 minutes south of London, and the legend is called the Ghost of Bluebell Hill. Now, Bluebell Hill is a little area. It's uh, about a mile or so away from my house now. Um, and it's a forested area. It's obviously quite a big hill, so it's really popular for people to go hiking on. And on a really nice day, you'll see a lot of people up there, uh, and you can see the town and all that. But the legend takes place in and around the roads that go around Bluebell Hill. So the way it goes is there are four women on the way to a wedding, a bride and three of her bridesmaids. At one of the intersections near a bridge by Bluebell Hill, they got in a nasty collision. I think it was like a three-car collision. Three of the women in the car died, including the bride-to-be. So what they say happens is you can see a woman on the side of the road when you're driving through there at night, and all of a sudden she'll dart out in front of the car, and when you hit her, she vanishes only for her to never be found, obviously. P many people have reported 
running into a woman, but they never found a body or anything. So they think it is this ghost of Bluebell Hill. There's also many reports of a woman hitchhiking, getting into the car of people and asking them to take her to her wedding and give some directions on where to go. And next thing you know, they look back and she has disappeared. So yeah, just a quick little hometown legend. Um, this area of England is really old, lots of Viking history, loads of castles. So maybe I'll call in in the future one day and give you some more hometown legends because there's loads of them. I love the show, love what you do. Can't wait to hear it. See ya. Thanks, Jordan. Now this is very traditional as far as this type of story is concerned. A tragic accident on the way to a celebration and subsequent haunting and the location of that tragedy. You hear that trope all the time in roadway-related hometown legends all over the globe. They even have a name for the phenomena. Most folks call those entities phantom hitchhikers. Despite how popular these legends may be, it's still certainly a shock to anyone that's unlucky enough to stumble upon one. Now, out of curiosity, I dug up a first-hand encounter of the Bluebell Hill ghosts, courtesy of the Shiver documentary series. But Ian Sharp knew nothing of these reported sightings as he drove home late one night in 1992. Coming down Bluebell Hill, he thought he saw a woman in the road. When I first saw her, she was standing in the center of the road by the crash barrier, just standing there. And I was driving down, I was doing about 50 miles an hour. And as I saw her, I started to break. And then she just sort of, not run, but a fast walk straight out in front of the car. And I hit her and it seems as if everything went into slow motion. She went under the car and as she went down, I hit her on the left on her left hand side and as I hit her she was looking at me eye to eye straight at me. Ian jammed on the brakes but when he got out to help the woman had vanished. Now imagine yourself driving down a darkened road knowing nothing of the legend and you seemingly hit a young woman with your car. What do you do? Well, most people do, as Ian Sharp did, and go to the police. He went straight to the police to report the accident. When I came back with the police, not knowing anything of this accident that happened 27 years beforehand, uh, I was still convinced there was somebody laying somewhere or... Uh, and we had a... Uh, the police had torches and they were looking all around and couldn't find anything at all. And it was the policeman then who told me it's another sighting of the Bluebell Hill ghost. Now that is a hometown legend. A big thanks, Jordan, for the long distance phone call. We appreciate you sharing that story tonight with us. Now then, next up we have a new caller a new location, and a new category. So from Georgia, please welcome Katie with her story about a local curse. Hey Derek, this is Katie from Atlanta, and this is for the hometown legend. So I am from a town called Yazoo City, Mississippi, and there is a legend of a witch that's pretty popular there that I grew up hearing about, and it's actually been in a couple of movies, and at least the cemetery that all of this takes place in. So the story was, you know, a hundred years ago, there was this witch who lived on the river there in town, and the sheriff showed up looking for bodies of men who had gone missing, and turns out she had been torturing and killing fishermen from the river and storing their bodies on her property. And so she made a run for it, and the sheriff chased her. But by the time he had caught up with her, she was sinking in quicksand that was near the river. So as she was sinking, she said, 
I am going to burn this town to the ground in 20 years for what you've done to me. Because the whole town thought she was a witch. When they buried her after she died, they put chains around her grave um, in order to keep her soul in the ground as well as her body. Then 20 years later, lo and behold, to the day, almost the entire town burned down. I think over 300 buildings when you counted for houses and businesses. So it was obviously very tragic. And some of the townspeople after the fire had finally died down, went to the cemetery where she was buried and saw that her chains had been broken around her grave. So yeah, that's the story. The legend still is widely talked about in the area. The grave you can still go to and visit. I don't think that there's even a name on it. I think it may just say the Witch of Yazoo. But yeah, so that's my hometown legend. Thanks. Love the show. Bye. Thank you, Katie. You know, that cemetery is another spot that you can actually visit, if you'd like. Glenwood Cemetery in Yazoo City, Mississippi. Now, I've included some additional info to this story, as well as most of the other entries here this evening. Just visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and click the show notes tab to take a look. And I certainly can't tell you that this or any other curse is real. But I can tell you that the people of Yazoo City seem to take all this pretty seriously. And thank you again, Katie, for sharing that entry. Now, with our next category of the evening, we work our way north to the state of Virginia, where Eric is waiting to share his infamous hometown legend. Hey, Derek. This is Eric from Virginia. I'm calling with an entry for Hometown Legends. I've actually heard you make reference to this once or twice in previous podcasts, but I don't know that the whole story has ever really been told. So here we are. The story I want to talk about is the Bunny Man Bridge in Fairfax County, Virginia. It is a uh, legend that originated, I think, probably in the late 60s, early 70s, where a bus carrying... Well, there's a couple of different variations, but I think the most popular one is that uh, a bus carrying mental patients crashed in Fairfax County. I mean, several escaped, and some were found living, some were found dead, but one in particular was found hanging from a bridge from an overpass, and there was a note that said the bunny man did this or something to that effect. That's kind of where the legend started. I mean, it's kind of taken off from there. I think there's some variations of the story where he feeds on rabbits and leaves dead rabbits hanging from trees or hanging on the bridge in the area. There's a, a variation of a guy in a bunny suit carrying an ax that will chop you up if you cross under the bridge on Halloween. I mean, there's actually some truth, I think, to them, is there was a guy in the area at one point who did harass people who hung around there looking for the bunny man. He would come out dressed. They said it was like a Ku Klux Klan robe, or some people said it was a bunny suit or long white robe or whatever, but uh, he would come out and kind of chase people off that were hanging there. So anyway, that's the gist of the uh, Bunny Man Bridge in Fairfax County, Virginia, and I love the podcast. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, Eric. The Bunny Man. You know, this is one of those urban legends that's been hanging around for quite a while. No pun intended. But believe it or not, the legend is true, albeit slightly altered from the original telling. Back in 2008, a librarian in the Fairfax, Virginia area set out to uncover the true origins of the Bunny Man. And this is what he found via the website Inside Nova. First, he delved into the Fairfax County Police records, searching for reports of old and sensational murders. He wrote in his December 2008 paper, The Bunny Man Unmasked, The Real-Life Origins of an Urban Legend. He found that one might help account for some of the Bunny Man's background. It happened in February 1949 and made headlines for months. The gruesome slayings of a mother and her eight-month-old baby girl. The two were found in a shallow grave in Fairfax after disappearing during a car ride with the husband. Police soon found the victims in a shallow grave The woman had been beaten and shot, the baby girl buried alive. 
The husband and father was eventually arrested, convicted, and sent to a mental institution. Next, the librarian searched for any evidence of a man dressed in a rabbit costume, terrorizing people in the Washington region. According to his paper, he found a gem in the Washington Post on October 22, 1970. The headline read, Man in Bunny Suit Sought in Fairfax. The story detailed a harrowing experience of an Air Force cadet who went quote-unquote parking with a girl on Guinea Road in Fairfax. The military man told of a man in a white suit, quote-unquote, with long bunny ears, throwing a hatchet through the car's windshield, then quote-unquote skipping off into the night, according to Conley's paper. The bunny man made another appearance, according to the Post, on October 30th, 1970. Neighbors on Guinea Road reported seeing a man in a bunny suit hacking away at a house under construction with a hatchet. Confronted by a security guard, the quote-unquote bunny ran off. Now, police investigated but never found any evidence of a bunny man in the area. After a few weeks, the case was filed away forever. So there was a bunny man, and there were some murders. It just doesn't seem that the two were ever connected. Although I will admit I'm not sure we can be 100% certain of that fact. You see, legends like this persist for a reason. And there is, as we learned here, typically some truth behind them. And if those reports are true, whoever, whatever the original bunny man was, could still be out there. Now I've linked to the full paper that librarian, historian, and activist Brian A. Conley wrote. So go to the show notes and have a look. And Eric, thank you again for tonight's first Madman submission. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Now when I'm in the flow of being productive and creative, that's when I'm feeling like my best version of myself. And I'm sure you have times when you feel like you are firing on all cylinders and you can take anything on. But sometimes life gets in the way of that and bogs us down with stress, grief, or trauma. And when you're feeling overwhelmed, it can feel impossible to show up in life the way you want to. Now I've found that therapy helps me work through those difficult stressors so I can keep showing up as the version of myself I want to be. We all have things to get off our chest and work through. And therapy is a powerful tool that can change your life. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient and affordable. And if for some reason you aren't vibing with the therapist you're matched with, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Now, if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash Monsters Among Us today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash Monsters Among Us. Now, as always, supporting our sponsors supports the show. So thanks for listening. And back to the spooky stuff. Now, tonight's last grouping of stories is, of course, Monsters, Creatures of the Darkness, and the things that go bump in the night. Whatever that means. And where better to start than the thick forests of Minnesota? Abby, welcome to tonight's program. Hello, Derek. My name is Abby. I am a second-time caller. Anyways, I am calling about hometown legends. I am from a small town in Minnesota called Frazee, Minnesota. It's a couple hours from Fargo, North Dakota. And in that town, there's a legend called the Hairy Man of Burgess. And Burgess is a neighboring town next to Frazee. It's basically the same town, Frazee, Burgess. That's basically it. And there are a set of back roads or trails in Burgess. And those trails are said to be super haunted. There's a lot of abandoned homes back there. There's an abandoned graveyard. I have a ton of stories about that. It's a whole deal. It's pretty creepy. But that is where everyone says the hairy man of Burgess lives, is in those back road trails. 
So basically, the hairy man, there's a couple of legends behind it. One of them is that it's a Bigfoot. Another one is that it's just an incredibly hairy man beast that is psychotic. Possibly, I don't know, someone living in the abandoned homes back there. The roads are just really scary. They're very narrow, lots of twists and turns. Anyways, I was about 17 or 18 years old, and me and about six other friends decided to pile into my friend Kay's old Chevy and Paula <laughs> and drive around the trails around like midnight. So I was already scared because I had been back there before and I already had experiences back there. And so, I don't know, I just wanted a throw. So we went back there and we were driving and all of a sudden Kay's car stops and shuts off. And so we all thought that he was playing a prank on us. And so we're like, what are you doing? Like, what the hell are you doing? Let's go. We're not trying to be stuck in these trails for the rest of the night. And her car would not turn over. <laughs> it, as much as she was trying, it just would not. Everything was correct. We had a couple of guys in the car with us, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. None of us wanted to get out of the car. Her headlights were off. We were stuck in the middle of these woods, and we were freaking out. And so the moon was pretty bright. There were some gaps in between the trees. And we saw this mass kind of, I want to say waddle or shift through the trees. I didn't really get a good look at it. I saw the general shape of it. It was pretty freaking big. <laughs> My friends swear up and down it's the hairy man of Virgus. But it was creepy because we saw that right after Kay, Kay's car basically shut down and we were sitting in the middle of the woods for five to ten minutes. And everybody was screaming. They're telling Kay to try again. But they were seeing the hairy man of Virgus. I have a couple of videos of that night. It's just it's a black screen because there was no lights and we're all screaming. So I don't think I'm going to send that in. But it was a pretty terrifying night. And as soon as the mask kind of went back into the forest, it kind of checked us out a little bit. Kay's car turned on and we got out of there as fast as we could. We probably weren't driving the safest. But that was basically it. I hope you look into the Hairy Man of Virgus. So yeah, that's my hometown legend story. Thanks, Abby. It sounds like you had quite an exciting evening. Now, the Hairy Man of Vargas, I'll be honest, is not something I was familiar with prior to this episode. Despite it being featured on a television show that I know I watched back in the day. Sci-Fi Channel's Haunted Highway. And here's a clip from the very first episode of that series, featuring another witness with an experience oddly similar to Abby's. Nice to meet you. Nice this is Jael. You. Hi, Jael. Thanks for meeting with us. Yeah. Well, thanks. I'm glad you guys finally got here. I was out here kind of waiting for you on my own, and I, I definitely don't like being in this area. Really? Really. Could you tell us a little bit about your sighting? My um, cousin and I were on snowmobiles. We were out in this area here, and we were just snowmobiling around, and all of a sudden, from the woods, came this, what I consider, larger than a man, completely covered with hair, long, stringy hair. And the thing that's always stuck with me is it had bare feet. And we're talking the middle of the winter in northern Minnesota. And it chased us. It had something in his hand. It could have just been where he grabbed a piece of wood and it started chasing us. And so then we took off on the snowmobile and once we, you know, looked back, it was no longer chasing us. I'll never forget it. I, I won't be out here at night because of that happening. Most of the sightings happen most at night? Of, yeah, most of the sightings do happen at night. You think that the, that the snowmobile noise, noise is either irritated or attracted it? I think the loud noise probably got its attention. You know, it's starting to become clear to me why they call it a hairy man instead of a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot. The creature was said to be wielding a club. Sounds more like your stereotypical caveman than some wild upright ape. But whatever it is, the Vargas area has completely embraced their monster. They hold the annual Hairy Man Festival and 5K each and every October. And even local businesses have embraced the creature as their very own mascot of sorts. Check out this local liquor store commercial that I found. And for the visuals here, imagine a really bad Bigfoot suit and some fella about half a dozen keystones deep. 
You can drink with the hairy man in a boat. You can drink with the hairy man while wearing a really long black coat. You can drink with the hairy man in the woods. You can drink with him while you're under the hood. You can drink with the straw, brah. You can drink with him in the park. You can drink with the hairy man in the dark. You can drink with the hairy man here or there. With the Vergas Municipal Liquor Store, you can drink with the hairy man anywhere. Now, if the hairy man doesn't make you want to drink, that commercial certainly will. Yikes. Anyway, it was very exciting to learn about this new little legend. So thank you, Abby, for taking the time to call it in. You know, if the Hairy Man Festival doesn't do it for you, maybe Ohio's Duct Tape Festival will. Or West Virginia's Roadkill Cook-Off. Or maybe Colorado's Frozen Dead Guy Days. Or this one that I might consider attending. The Lebowski Fest in Kentucky. And then, of course, we have Montana's Rock Creek Lodge Testicle Festival, where over 15,000 visitors consume nearly three ton of testicles over a three-day weekend. It's an average of just under half a pound per person or so, if you're trying to do the math. On that note, if you have a story you would like to share here on the show, simply give the hotline a call at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-N-I-G-H-T. Or you can shoot me an email at monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, I'm still looking for those paranormal investigator stories. And you still have a week or two to slip one of those in. Now our next hometown legend is another of the traveling spirits category. Tim from Wisconsin. Welcome to the show. Yes, uh, Derek. My name is Tim. I'm from uh, Wisconsin Rapids, originally in Wisconsin, but uh, I moved eventually to Stevens Point, which is about oh, 20 miles to the east of Wisconsin Rapids. And there are a couple of legends here that, ironically enough, have made a few television shows they've made two of these legends the two i'm going to tell you about have made the uh, top haunted roads in america and uh, a couple other websites the first i want to tell you about is bloody bride bridge um, i'm a skeptic in the truest sense of it that i enjoy doing these legend trips just to you know have fun and you know just see if i can get anything to trigger which i never have but it's more i enjoy the urban legend aspect of it the the situation for Bloody Bride Bridge is that a young bride was supposedly killed on her wedding night in an auto accident. Now, this is actually Highway 66, where it crosses the Jordan River just outside of the city of Stevens Point, just past the municipal airport. I have friends in the uh, police department, so I, I have asked them a couple questions about this, you know, any accidents, etc., now, according to the legend that when driving down this road, supposedly a police officer way back in the day witnessed the apparition of a young bride standing in, right in the middle of the road, and he tried to stop his squad car, and he supposedly struck the individual in the road. You know, he looked back, couldn't find it, see any body, and he was, you know, startled to see that she was sitting in the back seat of his car. Yeah, I guess it made him panic, according to the quote-unquote legend. Now, of course, that never happened, and you'd think that if a squad car did strike an individual, there would be some sort of documentation in the police department regarding it. Supposedly, if you drive down this highway, Highway 66, right on the Jordan River, you'll see the bride standing on the side of the road, still wearing her wedding gown, which I never have, and I've driven down it at midnight, according to the legend. Never seen it. The other suppose it there that if you stop right on the bridge at midnight and you look in the back seat uh, in your rear view mirror you'll see both the bride and the groom sitting in the back seat of your car again i've never seen either of these materializations of these phantoms i've also contacted a few people that i know in the stevens point police department and this has never happened nor has any person been killed at 
Bloody Bride Bridge. So it's it's all urban legend, but the the fact that it has made so many different television shows where they say, oh, it's one of the top haunted roads in America, has always kind of humored me because it literally has never occurred. There's no record of it ever occurring as an accident. There's no record of the police officer striking the individual on the road. And as far as I can tell, it's all word of mouth. The second one, which is very fascinating, is called Boy Scout Lane. I've heard several versions of this. It's just outside of Stevens Point, again. And the reputed history of it is because a troop of Boy Scouts were camping there, and they were murdered by the bus driver that drove them out to this area for a camping trip. Again, you'd think that if such a murder did exist, there would be some record of it somewhere, especially in the police department. I could not find any record of it occurring. Another version I've heard from several people would be that the Boy Scout troops just mysteriously had disappeared on the road and they were never seen again. Another one is that uh, while they were camping out there, some of them are wandering around and someone had dropped a lantern or the, the Boy Scout leader dropped a lantern and it started a fire and it killed the entire troop in a, like a grass fire blaze. Uh, there's no evidence of a mass murder or tragic fire ever being recorded. The road got its name because at one time, the Boy Scouts did own land out there. And apparently they did have intentions of building an actual Boy Scout camp out there, but it never materialized. And I'm not sure how the legend started that this mass murder occurred or the fire had occurred or what triggered that, given that it was just a place that they were going to build a camp and nothing like this has ever been reported, recorded, or existed that I have been able to find. I find it humorous that it's made a top haunted roads in America, this Boy Scouts Lane. I've been there at night. It's actually on private land, so you can only go so far, but I have gone down there as far as I can on the public side of the road, and I've never seen anything down there. Again, it's more just for my curiosity. I like urban legends, and that's exactly what it is, in my opinion. Again, the road is supposedly haunted, and uh, after you go there, um, at night, you sh you're supposedly able to see a lantern being carried by someone off in the distance. Supposedly, it's either the uh, bus driver or uh, one of the Boy Scouts or one of the troop leaders. Again, it never I've never seen this light, supposedly this phantom light off in the distance. So that supposedly is what happened, that, that the lantern was tipped over or a bus driver killed all the Boy Scouts that are out there camping. Again, I don't think it's ever happened. I've never seen any record of it uh, in my research. There's a, a few people that, um, you know, I've, I've spoken to about it, and they, they claim that they've seen the light on the road. I never have. But, I, I again, I find it fascinating how a couple urban legends uh, are just spread by er word of mouth, and it's almost like the telephone game to where... All of a sudden, now it's making the top 100 haunted roads in America. And I think actually it also made a top 25 haunted roads in America. But from my research, neither of these have ever happened. They're really wonderful stories to tell and, you know, kind of creepy tales that, that you'd probably tell around the campfire to get a spooky reaction. But that's pretty much it. None of these situations have occurred. And I would assume there's going to be some physical documentation in some police report somewhere if a bunch of Boy Scouts were murdered or if a bride was killed on a bridge. I believe in this for your hometown legends. It's kind of one of those things that's kind of a word of mouth thing. It's really fun to talk about. And people always mention it uh, when they want to get a good scare out of people. So I thought I'd just give it to you and let you use it for your hometown legends. Thank you very much, Derek, and you have a great show there, and I appreciate listening to it, especially the ghost stories. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tim. Bloody Bride Bridge. They really crossed off every box with that title. Blood. Check. Bride. Check. Bridge. Check. If they tossed in a crying baby, I think they'd hit them all. But how familiar does this story sound to us. It's awfully reminiscent of Jordan's Bluebell Hill story, heard earlier in the program. But it all really makes you wonder where these legends stem from. If they're not based in reality, then how were they created? And of course it goes without saying, but Boy Scout Lane is another of these very popular legends. So it's a great set of entries, Tim. And we thank you so much 
for making the report. So this next story bridges a topic that I guess touches a nerve for me. Because this story made my skin crawl. From the Empire State of New York, please welcome Billy to the program. Hey, how are you? Uh, My name is Billy, calling from Long Island, New York. And I guess this is a, a hometown legend. I just started working through all the episodes and came up a few times and there's one here that's always been interesting and just like to share it so you know on long island there's this lake that supposedly was named after a native american princess that drowned there so it's called lake ronkonkoma and it's the deepest lake or on long island and the thing about it is that for a while, people thought that it had these underground tunnels that led out to the ocean. And when people would drown in there, they wouldn't find the body or it was really hard to find the body. So which brings me to the story, really. It, it took place, I guess, in the 1600s. There's a lot of you know, Native American tribes that lived here on Long Island. And this one tribe that lived on the lake, the daughter of the chief, I guess her name was Princess Ron Conkimo, fell in love with one of the, the loggers that lived across the lake. And in the winter, they would walk out onto the ice and meet each other. Uh, and of course, the chief got wind of this and, you know, forbade his daughter to see this logger. And in the summer, she rode out to the middle of the lake and killed herself. Now, every summer after that, the lake always claims a life and it's always a male life and the bodies are never found and you know it's supposedly the princess claiming these lives because she wasn't allowed to wed the logger that lived across the lake so that's kind of the the legend around here uh, people still drown in the lake it's usually at night and teenagers and the statistics do show that it's definitely more males if not exclusively males that drowned in the lake but that's my story and i'll talk to you guys soon thanks absolute nightmare fuel and one of many scenarios that run through my mind as my feet dangle over open water which i'll be honest doesn't happen all that often because it's creepy as hell and to imagine a desperate vengeful spirit hiding below reaching and grasping with her rotting, bloated hands. And people dare ask why water freaks me out. Well, I tried and failed to find a list of official drownings in the lake. But from what I understand, one of the latest to fall victim to the lake was a woman who drowned back in 2017. So use that information however you'd like. But truth be told... There have been a lot of drownings that occurred there. And folks around those parts respect the curse. And I think I'd have to agree that they'd be wise to do so. Thank you again, Billy, for unlocking a new fear. Now, folks, the show might be going dark for a bit. But that doesn't mean that our merch shop will as well. Visit monstersamonguspodcast.com forward slash shop or hit that shop tab to pick up a t-shirt, hat, bag, tote, bolster, koozie, all kinds of stuff. And you'll have it all in time for the premiere of Season 15. Again, that's monstersamonguspodcast.com forward slash shop. Pick up a piece designed by your favorite paranormal-themed artist today. Now let's stay in the state of New York for this next static haunting story. Justin, take it away. Hi, Derek. This is Justin from Buffalo, New York. I have a hometown legend story. Actually, I have a story that segues into that, so I'll just tell both real quick now. Back in 2005, I was working at the Fisher Price store, which is a massive store in East Aurora, New York. And uh, attached to the store is this huge warehouse slash like production plant so like i was the janitor 
at night in this like large production place. I'll tell you what's scary is like a thousand malfunctioning tickle me elmos all intermittently giggling inside of dumpsters. <laughs> that's a little creepy, but uh, that's not it. So to cover this like huge area, I would drive a golf cart with a dumpster attached to the back of it. And I would drive down these long corridors, get out, go to every station, empty the trash, and then move on. Well, one night I was driving down and I, uh, I stopped, I was emptying trash, got back on, and I keep going down. I look down this one aisle and I see this guy like squatting down doing something. And I have no idea, but he's at like the far end of this corridor that's pretty much all just like loaded with boxes and just merchandise to be sold in the store. I know I work completely alone. I have this vast area to cover all by myself. So like just seeing this guy, he was like dressed in like, it looked like all denim, like just very casual working guy. And he was like sitting there squatting on the floor, looked like he was working with something. And I pulled back, looked down there and he was just gone. And like, I'm talking within seconds, I passed him, looked, seen him, stopped, reversed, and he was gone. I immediately thought like, oh my God, is that like some sort of like ghost or what? Because I've been obsessed with this for a long time and I, I have many stories. My mother claims that I attract the supernatural, so I don't know. Anyway, the following day, I go in, I ask, and I tell this lady that I see a little bit before my work day actually begins. I told her it, and she told me that there was a man that worked downstairs in that area that died down there. It's a mold ejection machine, and he was working on it, and somehow some safety thing malfunctioned, and his head was crushed inside of the machine, which is, you know, crazy. But in that conversation, you know, we started talking about ghosts and whatnot. She mentioned Gutelberg Cemetery. I'm not sure if anyone's ever called in with this or anything, but this is a hometown legend. Is uh, Gutelberg Cemetery in East Aurora is an old abandoned cemetery, and I guess Dr. Gutelberg used to, back in the 1800s, perform illegal abortions, and he would bury them in this one burial plot. And uh, eventually it was told that after he was found out and he was about to get busted, he hung himself in that cemetery. And legend says that if you go there on certain nights and whatnot, that you'll see him hanging or whatever. And there's like long time lore about this that you could look into. But the weird thing is, she told me that her and her boyfriend went there and they didn't see anything. But when they left, they got home and they found their whole side of their car loaded with little kid handprints. And I just thought like, wow, that's a really creepy story. The following day, I go back home and my stepsister and I, at this time, were you know, really into this stuff. And I told her about, but I didn't tell her that whole story. She started telling me about her Gutelberg experience. And she said that, she didn't see anything, but when they got in the car, the car wouldn't start. And then it felt like tapping on the car. And then the car finally started. They returned home. And when they got home, they opened the door and there was like a dozen or so little kid handprints all up and down the car. Now that's two exact stories back to back from two people that have never met each other that are almost identical. And... I didn't prompt any of it. I didn't even know about this story. It's just a really wild thing. Years later, back in 2017, 18, I want to say, my ex-girlfriend and I scheduled a, a little ghost adventure on our anniversary to go there. It was during the day because it's, I guess, police at night. And we didn't really see anything. I mean, it's very old. The tombstones, some are going back to like 1892, you know, early 1900 or whatever, but uh, we did not see anything. I took a bunch of pictures and, you know, we didn't get anything. So I don't know. It was just, uh, just a really wild story and there is a lot of lore surrounding that. Anyway, love your podcast. Yeah, thank you very much, Derek. Bye. 
Thank you, Justin. Now, first off, the mention of the potentially haunted Fisher Price store instantly made me think of something from my childhood. Now, I know I've talked about the Time Life books or Reader's Digest series on the paranormal. Those multi-book volumes that cover everything from cryptids to strange visions. Well, in one of those books that my grandparents had, I found a photograph. But first, a little background on the Toy Store connection. The haunted Toys R Us store in Sunnyvale, California. Strange paranormal events at this toy store have been linked to a hired hand named Yanni Johansson. He worked for a farmer and fell deeply in love with his daughter, but the feeling was not mutual. But Johnny waited, always hoping she would learn to love him. One day, while chopping wood, Johnny cut his leg. He tried to make it back to the farm, but he bled to death. He died on the site of this toy store over 100 years ago. And it's Johnny, they say, who today haunts the back rooms and aisles of this toy store, still waiting for his love. Now that clip is property of the 80s television program, Evening Magazine. And now, back to the photo. Now there was an infamous photo in one of those books that was taken at a seance at that particular Sunnyvale Toys R Us store. This seems to depict a tall, lanky man with his hands in his pockets. Now the claim made at the time is that this man was not part of the attending party, nor was he seen at the time the photo was taken. Now visit the show notes for a glimpse of the photo, but he sticks out like a sore thumb. The figure in question is the only one standing, and is doing so in the far back of the crowd. Everyone else in the photo participating in the seance is seated in the foreground. But you know I can do you one better. In my research of this call, I stumbled upon a video made while that photograph was being taken. And here's the clip, courtesy of That's Incredible on ABC. Now we wondered if our psychic Sylvia Brown could make contact with the ghost that was loose in the store. The best way was to set up a seance. We hired professional photographers to take pictures throughout the session. And it was in their cameras that the unbelievable appeared to happen. I, I, I really feel him now. I think he's in the back. Yeah, he's beginning to walk. Yeah, now he's coming very, very quickly. Just moving along to the right, turning his head now towards me. Johnny, come, uh, or Yanni, come towards me this way a little bit. Uh, he's got his hands in his pockets. He's looking down at his feet. These photographs were taken during the time that Sylvia Brown is talking to the ghost of John Johnson. The photograph in this proof sheet was taken with infrared film. At the same time, the photograph on this proof sheet was taken with high-speed film. The incredible thing is that the enlarged infrared photograph shows a shadowy figure standing at the back of the picture that does not show up in the photographs taken with high-speed film. Now, full disclosure, I almost didn't share the clip because it features Sylvia Brown, a long-suspected fraud and proven hoaxer. But I suppose it was just too cool on a personal level for me not to at least share with you guys. But despite all that, I do encourage you to go watch the video. The photograph is certainly intriguing, but I assume, like most things, it's also too good to be true. Now, as far as the rest of Justin's story is concerned, apparently this handprint thing is a common occurrence, not a Gutelberg cemetery. And from the sounds of this clip from Dave Lazinski on YouTube, they're lucky that handprints are all that they encountered. There's been people that have been hurt on their way there, on their way home, actually in the cemetery. This spring, one of our members from our organization was on a investigation with another organization and he was hit by a car while they were walking along the road on the way there. He and a group of friends used to pay monthly visits to Gulberg. They went there the one time and 
they, they stayed for quite a few hours. When they went out to the car and got in the car on the way home, when they turned the lights on, they could see all the fog and dew all over the windows of the car, and the car was covered with children's handprints all over the whole car. There was a cholera epidemic here in the early 1800s that killed a lot of young people. And many of the graves here, when you could still read them, they were of very young people. Now that clip features a ghost hunter and what I believe to be a historian in the local area. It seems to offer at least one other explanation for the phantom and prince, albeit still a supernatural one. And it's all good stuff, Justin, and we thank you for taking the time to share your hometown legend here with us. Now, folks, next up is another curse. I suppose something like it. Sam from Michigan. Welcome to the show. Hey, Derek. This is Sam. I'm calling from your work with you. I wanted to call and tell my story. I've been a long-time listener, and I was kind of upset because I've just been procrastinating on this story, and it has to do with uh, gins. Yeah, I was a little upset because I wanted to kind of be the, the first one to talk about gins because I've never heard really anyone else call in with any gin stories, so this is mine. And I guess you could use this for the hometown legends because it is a family story that comes from my hometown in Lebanon. Uh, I'm Lebanese Muslim. So just to give a very, very brief intro to people that don't know what a jinn is, in Islamic mythology, it's believed that God, uh, when he created people, he created two other beings before humans. The first being angels, which were uh, created from light and the jinn, which was created from a smokeless flame, as it says in the Quran. So a lot of Muslims really do hold on to the belief that jinns are literal beings. They're, they're creations created by God. And one of the interesting differences about jinns, as opposed to demons in Christianity and Judaism and other faiths, is that jinns have the ability to choose to be good or evil. And most of the encounters that come about as hauntings, you know, shapeshifters and stuff like that, we would attribute, Muslims would attribute to uh, in evil terms. And a lot of the kind of guardian angel circumstances or stories we'd attribute to uh, good gens. So here is my family story. Uh, we come out from a small rural village in southern Lebanon. It's a farming village, it's not a city, it's a very small town. And the story goes that my great-great-grandfather, who was a merchant, had closed a shop and he was walking home with his donkey. They didn't have cars back then, the streets were very narrow, so my great-great-grandfather rode a donkey back and forth from his store. Uh, I forgot to mention, he was sitting on a like a special saddle they have for donkeys. He was uh, riding the donkey, and along the street, he saw what he thought was a older woman cloaked in a black hijab. It's very common for a lot of older women to wear all black hijabs or uh, a niqab, which is kind of a gown. And back then, it was customary to you know respect your elders and help them. And he uh, asked the older woman if she needed a, a ride home because she looked like she was struggling to walk. And she said yes. So he had her ride with him on the donkey and she was holding on to his waist. And as they were heading down the dirt road or stone road, he could feel her breathing changing and he said that her fingers, he could feel them growing longer and longer, wrapping more and more around his waist. And the breathing was changing. And he said that he was just overcome with this immense feeling of dread and danger. And the breathing was changing more and more to where her, and her fingers were growing more and more to the point that he said that they 
started to feel like claws digging into his skin. So my grandfather had a knife that he kept around his waist. So he felt the woman's fingers uh, turn into claws and started digging into him. And she was breathing heavier and heavier to where it kind of sounded like very labored, drawn out breaths. And he didn't really get a good look at her, but he could feel that her face was changing as well. So he took out his knife very quickly, cut the strap off that wraps around the donkey's body, uh, connecting the saddle to the body of the donkey. He cut the strap off and shoved the woman off and shoved her off to the side of a farm field. And he just had his donkey run as fast as it could. And uh, he didn't look back. He just rode his donkey home. And uh, this was on the route to his store. So as he was going back the next day, this was daytime. So he felt safer. He decided to take the same route that he was on the previous night. And he saw the saddle, which was, you know, very tough leather back at that time. And he saw the saddle in the field, and it was ripped to ribbons, he said, as if someone had cut cloth or paper with a very sharp pair of uh, scissors or, or a knife. It was just shredded. It was one of the scarier stories that's been passed down to the family. Uh, I've never had this experience myself. I'm always kind of keeping my mind open because I'd love to have an experience. As weird as that sounds, but I've never experienced anything paranormal. But my family does have a lot of gin stories, so uh, I love the show. I've been listening since the very beginning. And uh, if anything, you know, if, if you're out there listening to Derek and you have a story, just do not procrastinate. Just call in and donate your story. Thanks, everyone. Happy Halloween, and hope everyone's staying safe. Bye. Thank you, Sam, and happy Halloween. Now, frankly, I'm surprised I don't hear more about the djinn here in these Hometown Legend episodes. But I will say, you did a great job of covering it, Sam. And while I'm certainly no djinn expert, or even novice for that matter, I did provide some further information via Monstrum's coverage on the deity, entity, or whatever you want to call it. I've linked to Dr. Emily Zarka's coverage on the subject over in the show notes, if you'd like to dive a little deeper. And I love the story, Sam. Very clever of your grandfather to cut the cinch to free himself of this attachment. That's certainly one way to ditch a gen. Well, it's been a bit. How about we feature another monster story? And why not from a familiar face or voice? Alan from Texas. Welcome back to Hometown Legends. Hey Derek, this is Alan from Texas. This is for Hometown Legends. And if my voice sounds a little rough, it's because I'm kind of uh, in the process of recovering from laryngitis. I had a cold that went right to my throat. And uh, still recovering from it. But anyway, I wanted to get this recorded and sent in for Hometown Legends. I know you like uh, dogman stories and that kind of thing. So this is a dogman or a werewolf story. It's called The Converse Werewolf. But before you get too excited about it, uh, I think there's lots of problems with this uh, even sounding like an authentic uh, folktale. And I'll... Uh, talk about that after the story but um this was supposed to have taken place uh, a long time ago like uh maybe 150 years ago back in the 1800s in the area that is now uh has the city of converse which is a suburb of san antonio it's to the east of san antonio and of course back then there was no town there that was way before the city was ever founded so it was all just open country with uh, some cattle ranches. And this particular story is about a rancher who had a son that uh, he didn't approve of his son's behavior. His son was 
for lack of any better term, kind of a sissy. Uh, he didn't want to do work. You know, if you live on a ranch, you have to work cattle. He didn't want to work cattle. He didn't want to go hunting and supply the family with with food to eat. He just wanted to kind of lay around and read and not do much else. So uh, his father decided to get tough with him, and he sent him out to hunt and told him not to come back home till he had a deer. And he went hunting in this area, or the ranch was in an area supposedly of a creek called Skull Crossing. This is important later. So the son was gone for about a day, and then he came back. He didn't have a deer, and he uh, acted pretty shaken up, and he told his father that at, he thought he had been stalked by some kind of monster that looked like a cross between a man and a wolf and was huge and covered with fur. And he was afraid to go back out there again. And, of course, his father thought he was just making up some crazy story and told him to get back out there and kill a deer and not come back till he had a deer. So the son went out again anyway, and a few days went by and he never came back home. So the father went looking for him, took... Uh, a few other guys with him, and they came upon what was left of his son still in the process of being devoured by this huge fur-covered monster beast that looked like a cross between a man and a wolf, like a werewolf, supposedly stood about eight feet tall. And they took a few shots at it, because of course they were armed, and either they missed or the bullets had no effect, and it ran away into the brush and was never seen again. And then in the aftermath of this, the father's health declined, and uh, he lost his appetite, stopped eating, and within a few months he died. That's the whole story. Now, uh, to me, this sounds like a, like an urban legend because it's got this uh, moral. It's kind of got a moral, and it's very melodramatic. It just sounds like more of an urban legend than a real folk tale. And another thing that makes it sound strange is that uh, this monster doesn't appear anywhere else. It just comes out of nowhere for this one incidence and disappears, and that's it. There's nothing before this, nothing after it. It's, that seems kind of strange to me. There's not any kind of ongoing lore about a, a werewolf-type monster in the area. And, of course, we don't know the name of this rancher or the name of his ranch. So that's another thing that kind of uh, sets my spidey sense off. It also seems kind of strange to me that even though the kid had been gone for a few days, well, he wasn't a kid. He was like an older teenager, apparently. But he had been gone for a few days, and, and uh, when they found him, the uh, monster was still there, still devouring the guy, which seems like a, an unlikely coincidence. But maybe the biggest problem is that it was supposed to take place in an area where there was a creek called Skull Crossing. And sometimes they'll even say the ominously named Skull Crossing. But to begin with, the original Skull Crossing, it has been misspelled somewhat since then, mostly because of, I think, in my opinion, probably because of the internet and the way people want to make things more dramatic. Uh, it's been spelled skull like the part of the skeleton with a K, but originally it was uh, someone's name. It was spelled with a C, S-C-U-L-L. And there is no creek called Skull Crossing. As the name strongly suggests, it's not a creek. It's a crossing where you can cross a creek. And in this case, it's the Cibolo Creek, which is spelled C-I-B-O-L-O. -O. It's a creek that runs through this area. Now, uh, Skull Crossing is still there. There's a road named that, and the crossing over the Cibolo Creek is still there. And like I was saying, probably the biggest problem is that it is not in the Converse area. It's not even in Bear County, the same county as Converse. It's in Wilson County. It's in the county where I live. And uh, it's crossing over the Cibolo. It's on a little county road. It's a, it's a narrow county road, just barely two lanes wide. And as you get down to where the uh, creek is, it's the road kind of curves a lot, uh, probably following the old path of, of the old road that used to be there or the old trail that used to be there decades and decades ago. It comes down to the creek, and 
it has a very narrow, like one lane bridge, low water crossing over the creek. Uh, the creek is very narrow there. So I suppose that was probably an easy place for people to cross on horses. It might be so shallow that you can just walk across it. In some places, the Subalo Creek is like that. I know from experience, there's some places where you can just walk across it. Other places where you definitely can't. Or possibly someone, whoever owned the place, probably someone named Skull, maybe built a little wooden bridge across it or possibly even made a little ferry, you know, with uh, ropes and pulleys that you could pull yourself across, pull yourself and your horse and maybe a wagon or something across. I drove through it yesterday just because I'd never actually been through there before and I I wanted to see it and uh, I went into town. Oh, I should say, uh, I did say it was not even in Converse. It was miles away from Converse. It's actually in Lavernia, which is uh, the town of my address. And uh, I went in yesterday and bought some groceries at the supermarket. And then I brought it up on Google Maps. And it's only three miles away from the store where I bought groceries. And so I drove through it. It's just a nice, quiet little county road. It's paved now. You can look it up on Google Maps. Uh, the Google car drove through there, so there's a street view of it, and you can see what it looks like. But they took that picture on Google Maps. The street view is was taken about a month before they begin construction on the bridge, so it's not quite as bad now as it looks in that picture. It's a little bit wider, and the, it was completely rebuilt, so it's got a new surface and <laughs> new guardrails. If you look at it, you can see where one of the guardrails is broken. It's not like that anymore. They put better guardrails up. And uh, over on the sides of the bridge, the creek bank is, they kind of reinforced some of the creek bank with, looks like maybe caliche or uh, like surplus uh, smashed up concrete. So it's not just uh, bare dirt and you can stand on it better because it's a popular place for people to fish. Uh, there's places where you could just park off on the side of the road and get out of the way of traffic and then walk down there and just fish right off the bank. And in fact... When I drove through there yesterday, there was a family fishing right off the bank there. So I'm not sure where this story originated or uh, why it was set in Converse when uh, all these little details indicate pretty strongly that it, if there's any story at all, it shouldn't have been set in Converse. So I don't know, but kind of disappointing. But <laughs> but uh, I guess that's just how it is. And that's... I guess that's the whole thing. Enjoy the podcast. And uh, the Hometown Legends are always my favorite episodes. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. It's great to hear from you as usual. And I hope that you're feeling better soon. The Converse Werewolf. Yet another Hometown Legend that I'd never heard of. And they got the name right on this one. It's certainly catchy. Well, all this talk of werewolves in Texas reminds me of a photograph that went viral just last June. Another unidentified Texas critter. How many of you remember last summer's Amarillo werewolf? Well, a strange creature has been spotted outside the Amarillo Zoo, and it's not an animal. It's not exactly a human. Take a look. Security cameras captured what appears to be a wolf man walking around the property. City officials say this image is real, and they're baffled by its mysterious appearance. So now they're asking for the public's input to figure out what the heck is it. Some have suggested it could be Chupacabra, that <laughs> mythical beast-like predator <laughs> that's become an so. urban legend. And others are calling this guy a UAO, as an ident- unidentified Amarillo object. What do you th- that clip courtesy of KABC, ABC News 7 out of Los Angeles. And before you go getting excited, Amarillo and San Antonio are some 500 miles apart. So a likely connection here is, in my opinion, quite unlikely. But that certainly doesn't take away from the fact that it was a nifty little story. And we appreciate it, as always, Alan. Thanks for calling in. And now for a little pit stop with Steph from up in Canada. Hi, Derek. My name is Steph. I live in Canada. I'm calling with a hometown legend that I thought you might be interested in for one of your hometown legend shows. 
I grew up in a small town in southern Alberta in Canada called Bazano. It's located right next to the Trans-Canada Highway. In the late 80s or early 90s, I don't remember exactly, I was just a kid, the Alberta government built a peerage-shaped rest stop. It was supposed to represent a teepee, and this was on the Trans-Canada Highway between Bazano and Brooks, another town in southern Alberta. The rest stop cost over a million dollars to build, and it became known as the Million Dollar Toilet to the locals. It wasn't long after it was built that there were stories of a traveler getting murdered while using the washroom there at night. This was just a rumor. I don't think anything like that actually happened there. Anyways, the rest stop is said to be haunted by the murder victim. The story goes that if you stop there to use the toilet at night, his ghost will reach under the door of the stall and grab your legs and pull on them. Even though the story isn't really based in fact, it's widely believed and No locals will use this rest stop. Only people who are just passing through who don't know the story stop there. When I was a teenager, friends and I used to go there and try and experience or see something or just to scare each other, but nothing paranormal ever happened. I just find it really interesting that a story that isn't based in any facts or truth is so accepted by the local people that it keeps them away. Like, even I won't use the million dollar toilets when I go through to visit family and I know the story isn't true. That's just how ingrained it is into all of us, but I guess that's what makes a really good uh, hometown legend. Anyways, I really enjoy the podcast, especially the hometown legends episode, and uh, take care. Thanks. For some reason, I think several of you might be thinking of this on your next rest stop. And having visited many highway rest stops across the country myself, I can attest to the fact that a majority of them give off that murdery vibe. Well, maybe it's just the fluorescent lighting. But whatever the reason, stay safe on your next stop. And thanks again, Steph, for calling in. Now you know not all of tonight's entries fit neatly within the confines of our hometown legend taxonomy. Some, like Greg's call from North Carolina, offers up a little bit of everything. Howdy Derek, this is Greg from Ash County, North Carolina. I was calling in for the hometown legends. I actually have two for you. First one is of Devil Stairs. Everybody's heard of Devil's Tromping Ground in Raleigh, North Carolina, I'm sure. Well, in the mountains near Tennessee, we have one called Devil Stairs. And the legend is that you'll hear the classic woman crying or baby crying or little girl crying because of deaths and murders and little girl dying because she got ran over by the train that used to go through the area. Another classic one for us is a young African-American was blue to pieces when they was building her railway because his job was to put the dynamite in the drilled holes in the rock and no one checked that day to make sure he was away and they accidentally set off the charges not knowing he was up there said that they found body parts for days and that never could find his head so that when you drive by late at night you'll see a headless figure in that area dancing or standing on the steps and the steps are just flat rocks that was placed in the bank that looked like stair steps going along the bank Another one of the stories is that you drive through late at night and you'll see red eyes in the back of your car in the rearview mirror or the phantom hitchhiker and see somebody stop, pick them up. And if you do, that your car all of a sudden shut off or they'll just disappear out of the passenger seat. I've never experienced anything. I drive through here every night and every day. My grandfather, though, told me one time that he had somewhat of an experience said he was driving through early in the morning about three or four to go to work and said that the rifle in the back glass of his truck lifted up off the rack and thudded into the back seat of it and said that he'd never done that before and never done it after it was just random that one morning not saying that's supernatural or nothing but it was just kind of spooky for him never had nothing like that happen to him the second one is out of valley crucis north carolina next door there's the legend of the valley crucis hellhound legend is that two boys uh, dropped their dates off after night out and when they ran the curve at the valley crucis church 
beside the graveyard, a giant black dog with red eyes jumped out from behind one of the tombstones and chased their car until they finally crossed where the two rivers meet and said that supposedly the dog stopped there. But I've been by the church and at nighttime it is creepy because the graveyard is level with like your windows in your vehicle. It is not below your vehicle. It's up a little bank that's above the road. So it is kind of eerie late at night to see it. Also, something else I was wanting to add to this was I've heard a lot of talk on your show about the Brown Mountain Lights. And I've spent a lot of time in that area. Not saying that they ain't real. I strongly believe in the supernatural. But I just wanted to let you and all the other listeners know there is ways to hoax that. Because me and some friends done it one time off of Highway 181. There is a dirt road at mile marker 17 roughly that goes off into this little valley well there's primitive campground sites down there where a bunch of people camp because it's part of pisgah national forest and we used to spend a lot of time down there well there used to be a dirt road that went from that area over brown mountain to an area called wilson's creek the road is no longer there because i guess it washed out a lot and the forest service could not keep it up enough so they blocked it off on the Wilson's Creek side. I don't know how far it is off the highway side, but when you get to the top of the mountain before starting down it, there is a trailhead that goes along the Brown Mountain Ridge line. And my friends, two of them hiked in, and me and two others went to an overlook off of 181 with walkie-talkies and could see their headlamps, look just like what you'd see or hear about the Brown Mountain lights floating and being out there shining. And also there is four-wheeler trails back there in the Brown Mountain ATV park and stuff. So there is some paths back in there, but not major highways. Yeah, I just wanted to call and let you know that it can be faked at times, but not saying that it always has been. But yeah, I appreciate everything you've done with the show. Love listening to it. Hope to hear this on your show and good luck. Keep it up. You see, a little bit of everything. Thank you, Greg. Now, it's very interesting to hear those details about the Brown Mountain Lights. Now, if those trails exist over traditional routes, Greg's theory could even explain OG reports of the lights from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Of course, anyone walking these trails at night would have had lanterns or torches that would give off a similar effect to modern-day sightings. So you might just be onto something, Greg. And that's some info that we should all keep in mind the next time we're discussing those notorious ghost lights. Thanks again, Greg. Now our next entry takes us back to the state of Texas. There sure are a lot of hometown legends from the Lone Star State. Well, Josh, you might as well add to that collection. Welcome to the program. Hey, Derek. This is Josh again in Austin, Texas, with uh, something like a hometown legend story for you. It's really more of a family story that involves my great-grandparents. So my great-grandparents' name were uh, Bessie and Milton, and they lived on a ranch out in kind of northwest Texas near Ballinger. And... This story would have taken place probably in the late 20s, early 30s, maybe, somewhere in that range. This would have been when my grandma would have been a pretty young child. So that's kind of where I'm guessing this story happened. So to set the scene, this the ranch at that time was pretty large, probably over a thousand acres. And it sat right on the Colorado River. So, the you know, this big big piece of land right along the river and at that time there were these big old stands of pecan trees along the river Uh, now they're gone um, because they put a lake in that area and they all got drowned probably i think that was in the 80s or 90s when that happened but at this time there were some pretty large stands of pecans very old big pecan trees along the river and that's important for the story so the story begins with my great-grandfather Milton storming into the house one day and 
telling Bessie and the kids they're not going to believe what he's just seen, what's just happened to him. And they kind of just rolled their eyes at this because he's a pretty well-known prankster and he's known for pulling off some pretty elaborate pranks, even on his own family, <laughs> which there's some really good stories, but none of them are supernatural. So maybe another podcast could use those, <laughs> but they are already not taking him seriously. And he tells them that he's seen this huge red monkey up in the pecan trees and it was throwing pecans at him. And they just are like, oh yeah, whatever, Milton. Like, this is your usual nonsense. And he's kind of upset by this. He's like, no, no, this is real. I saw this thing. And they don't believe him. So a few days go by and some of the cows on the ranch, they had at this time, they had cows and sheep and they kept bees. And some of the cows have gone over to a sandbar in the middle of the river and it falls to Bessie to go and herd them back onto the right side of the river. So she's down in one of these big pecan groves and she goes to start trying to wrangle the cattle back onto the right side of the river. And all of a sudden something pelts her in the head and she's kind of like, oh, what was that? But she doesn't think too much of it. She just carries on with what she's doing. And then again, something hits her in the back of the head. And this time she looks down, it's a big green unripe pecan. And so she turns and she looks in the direction that it came from. And lo and behold, up in the tree, there's a big ape with reddish fur staring back at her. So at this point, she gets out of there. She goes back to the house and tells everybody, you know, there really is a big red monkey up in the trees down there. Um, and Milton gets to kind of say, told you so. And at this point, Milton and Bessie are now talking about this big red ape that they've seen in the trees. And the next time he goes into town for something, he asks around and it turns out that an orangutan had recently escaped from a traveling circus that had come through the town of Ballinger and they had lost it. They didn't know what happened to it. It escaped. The circus just moved on. So now there is this orangutan just running around out in kind of northwest Texas and the story goes that they got a big group of men together and they were able to capture this orangutan and get it back to the circus but yeah that's the story it's a good kind of out of place animal story I know some people don't like those but I know you like them and this one has uh, you know it comes full circle we find out where the creature came from so, yeah, hope you like that one. You know, like everybody says, the, the podcast is, is great, and we love it, and keep up all the good work. That's what I'm talking about. Another classic hometown legend. An escaped ape of some sort. And while it's technically not a monster per se, it is a frightening concept. Those things can be nasty when they want to be. Rip your arm off and beat you to death with it kind of vibes. So I suppose having a few pecans thrown at you isn't the worst thing in the world here. And of course, this is not the first story out there that details encounters with escaped apes. In fact, I have a newspaper article for you, originally appearing in the Wheeling Register of West Virginia on September 21st, 1882. And also featured in Adam Benedict's book, Monsters in Print, a collection of curious creatures known mostly from newspapers. Page 92, if you're following along at home. The Gyasticus, Wheeling Register, September 21st, 1882. Loose in the woods of northern Pennsylvania. Wild excitement among the Grangers near Erie. Startling rumors of a hairy monster prowling through the forest, seeking whom it may devour. Erie, Pennsylvania, September 19. The wildest excitement prevails here in consequence of startling rumors that came flying in from the western suburbs that an immense wild animal of terrible proportions was roaming the woods and tearing the roads and lands of McKean Township. The wildest story heard was that this savage monster, said to walk erect on its hind feet, had seized the three children on their way home from school and had dismembered and devoured them. 
in sight of their parents. Before noon, this wild horror had so multiplied that it was said the entire village had been mangled and torn by this fearful animal. The coming of Barnum Circus here tomorrow gave room for surmise that the dreadful thing was one of the wild men depicted on the glaring posters that illustrate the city just now, or that one of the strange Asiatic or African beast had broken loose. An investigation developed the following facts, which, as usual, fall considerably below the sensational rumors that were circulated. The true story. About five o'clock last evening, residents of the village were terrified by seeing an immense wild and fearful looking animal rushing toward them from the south across the meadows of H. DeWalt. It crossed the road and entered a wheat field on the farm of Mrs. E. Vorse, tearing down the fence, strong barbed without any effort. It turned from the direction of the spellbound people and went down to the creek, where it was lost sight of. The alarm was raised, and the people armed and turned out to track and kill the ferocious animal. A pack of hounds were put upon his scent, and amid their yelping and the cries of the beaters, the hunt was commenced. Across the meadow and farmlands traversed by the brute, its tracks were plainly seen, the impress of its feet being clear and well-defined. The reporter measured one of these tracks. It was found to be 16 inches long and 8 inches wide at the ball, each of the footprints being about 5 feet apart. The chase grew more exciting as the evidences of recent exhibitions of its terrible strength grew thicker, and it was noticed that many of the valorous hunters fell off. At last, the hounds refused to proceed, and no amount of discipline could induce them to take up the chase. Darkness came on before the hunters were aware of it. An excellent time was made in getting out of the woods. Extra attention was paid to locks, bolts, and bars when the farmers got home and doors and windows were barricaded. It was a sleepless night for the people at McKean. About 2 p.m. today, the utmost terror reigned. Terrible noises were heard, and Mrs. S. Skinner, looking from her window, saw her cows rushing in great haste from the woods in which they had been grazing. Henry Kohler, a thoroughly reliable person, says he caught a glimpse of the creature at this time and that it was unlike any monster he had seen even in a circus, and that it stood erect on its hind feet. Fright is the worst that the people of McKean have to suffer. There have been no deaths or hurts of any kind, the positive assertions to the contrary notwithstanding. It's generally believed to be some circus animal at large. In the meantime, the good people of McKean don't stroll far from home or indulge in lonely walks abroad. Evening promenading of lovers has ceased for the time. Lengthy, but interesting. And wouldn't you know it, that's not the last story out there either. This contemporary example taking place again in Pennsylvania. There is an update now to a story from central Pennsylvania. This one involves monkeys on the loose after a crash, we're not making this up. There were a hundred monkeys on a truck that crashed Four of those monkeys got loose, according to police. And this morning, all but one of the monkeys have been located. Officials say no one should attempt to look for or capture the animal. The crash happening in Danville, Montour County along Route 54 just last night. Now that clip courtesy of WPVI, ABC News 6 out of Philadelphia. And I believe that a woman that stopped on the side of the road to offer help fell ill after coming in contact with these monkeys. So maybe having your arm ripped off isn't the biggest fear we should have. Thanks again, Josh, for sharing your entry. And yes, I know the difference between monkeys and apes. It's just an example. Just like I know the capybara is the world's largest rodent not mammal, as I mistakenly said on the previous episode. I received a lot of emails from you over that one. And believe it or not, we actually do have a proof-listening system. But I suppose that little error just slipped on through. But let's not let this next call slip by so easily. Because as far as hometown legends go, this one is near gold standard. Please, welcome Sean from Wisconsin. 
to tonight's program. Hello everyone out in Monsters Among Us land. This is Sean from Wisconsin and I have a hometown legend for you. I grew up in southern Wisconsin, just outside of Madison. And on my way to a town called Dodgeville, we used to have to pass through Ridgeway, Wisconsin. And Ridgeway, Wisconsin is a town of about 600 or so people. It's not very big, but it's one claim to fame is that it actually has a ghost so famous that ghost has its own Wikipedia page. The Ridgeway Ghost, as it's called, comes out of legends around 1840 or so, just prior to Wisconsin statehood. At this point, Wisconsin is a farm area. It is a mining area. Most of southern Wisconsin was taken up with Welsh and Cornish and Irish miners at this point, and they're digging lead out of the sides of the Wisconsin hills and all kinds of shenanigans were getting about. But the Ridgeway ghost comes out of this little town called Ridgeway, and no one is quite certain where it started or who the ghost is. Some legends say it was a a soldier who was walking along the Military Ridge Trail or, you know, being moved out for the Indian Wars that Wisconsin fought many years ago. Something terrible happened to him and he became this ghost. Or else the story kind of has an origin where these two brothers were at McKillop's Saloon in Ridgeway in around 1840 or so, and a bunch of men got drunk and started picking on the boys or something happened in a poker game or something of that nature, and the boys were brutally murdered by this crowd of rowdies. One was thrown into a fire where he burned in agonizing death, and then the other one escaped the saloon and tried to run back home in the middle of a cold Wisconsin winter night, and he froze to death before he got home. And so some stories say that these brothers became the Ridgeway ghost, or else some stories say that the the boy's mother became the ghost because she died of a broken heart afterwards and then became this spirit of vengeance almost, or this trickster spirit that torments Ridgeway because of the deaths of her sons. Now, I don't know exactly what the origin is, because there's so many stories involving this ghost, but we do know that the ghost story started around 1840, and the first person to see it was a doctor, actually, a a guy by the name of Dr. Cutler. And Dr. Cutler was driving home one night in his wagon, and uh, he had a team of two horses pulling the wagon. And as he was passing by Ridgeway, he happened to see a dark shadow of a man standing on the sway bar between two horses of his team. And it stood and it looked at him and he looked at it and a mile or so past where neither man said anything, you know, neither the man or the ghost said anything and the ghost kept staring at him and finally Dr. Cutler looked away and when he looked back, the ghost was gone. But the ghost had suddenly appeared on his right side sitting on the seat next to him, saying nothing. Well, he started to panic. He, he grabbed his whip and he whipped at the ghost and the ghost disappeared. The doctor went back, told his friends what had happened and his friends didn't believe him because the doctor was apparently a bit of a drinker. But he swore by it. He swore he was dead sober at the time and he knew what he saw, but his friends refused to believe it. Well, this was only the start of things. At this time, around about this time, there was another man by the name of John Lewis who lived in the Ridgeway area, and he was a champion wrestler in the United States, and then he had retired to this farm in Ridgeway, and he was very sober and very Christian, and he was possessed of tremendous physical strength, and one night, while he was helping a friend butcher some hogs, he was walking back about dusk, and as he was approaching a stone wall, getting ready to climb over it, a ghost appeared, and he and the ghost kind of stood looking at each other for a long time, and eventually that ghost just disappeared. It vanished. Well, John Lewis, you know, knew about this ghost. He'd heard some stories, and so he started telling his friends about it, and his friends began to believe it. The ghost appeared to John Lewis again, several nights later, but this time John was ready. He had a knife on him, and he stabbed at the ghost. Well, the ghost ceased to be a ghost. It became a vortex instead, a a whirlwind, and the whirlwind picked him up and crushed him. And this is a man of tremendous physical strength, so for something to crush this man like that, it would have had to have been an extreme amount of power. Well, he was crushed into insensibility, as the article says. Some men found him on the side of the road, barely conscious. He was carried home, 
and he told his story before he died that this ghost actually murdered him. Well, this vindicated Dr. Cutler's story, obviously, but this then became a firestorm of stories then where people, everybody in Ridgeway wanted to have these experiences with the ghost and the ghost ended up having many, many different stories. The, the ghost was a shape-shifting phantom, they said. It, it could change into a man. It could change into a shadow. It could change into a white mist. It could change into a vortex. It could change into a pig. It could change into an old woman. It could become anything it needed to be for the story's sake, so to speak, which, again, makes you wonder if it was just people telling each other ghost stories or if there was actually a ghost. One of the stories was that two men were carrying a plank between their shoulders, you know, uh, one... 12, you know, it was a 12 foot plank or so, one man on one end, another man on the other end. And as they were walking through the night with this plank, carrying this plank home, the ghost appeared standing on the plank. Well, the men panicked and they started to run and the ghost thought this was great sport. So he started swatting at them with a, a switch, beating them like they were horses. And they ran until they couldn't run anymore. And when they fell down exhausted, the ghost was gone. Another story has a teamster, a man hauling a big wagon load of pig lead, stopping at a saloon because he knew he had to go past, you know, the Military Ridge Trail where the ghost was known to haunt. And he needed something to steal his, his soul. And so he had a couple drinks. And when he came outside to get back into his wagon and, and go, he found that his oxen had been detached from the wagon and hooked to a hitching post. And then he saw the ghost walking, carrying his lantern and whip. Well, that teamster obviously did not go further that night. He, he paid the money and stayed in the hotel rather than risk going through the Phantom's territory in dark. Another great story was that a miner was walking home from work one night, and it was after dark, and he noticed he was being followed by someone, and it was a hazy shadow of a man. And so the miner started to walk a little faster. Well, the shadow man started to match pace. So the Welsh miner started to jog, and then the phantom started to keep pace with that. And so by the time he got home, he was at a full sprint, dead out, just, just sprinting as fast as he could. And the ghost was right on his heels. And when he finally collapsed in his yard, the ghost came by, patted him on the back, and in one of the few times it's actually ever said anything, said, that was some good running you were doing. And then he vanished. One time, a young farmer saw the ghost and he had been hunting so he had his gun on him and he shot at it but nothing happened and the ghost just kind of meandered away another time a farmer was driving his his team through the fields and a massive black dog appeared by his side and, and kept pace with him for several miles it never did anything and then just vanished so there was all these stories about the ridgeway ghost and when i was a kid you had to drive through Ridgeway, and just off of Highway 151, off to the left, you could see this dilapidated old farmhouse that someone had spray-painted Home of Ghost on the side. And I remember when I was a kid seeing that farmhouse and wishing I could see a ghost, and I never did, unfortunately, but the stories were always great. The Ridgeway ghost story is integral to the town of Ridgeway, so much so that they actually have a ghost spray painted on their water tower and the police badge for the, the few members of the police force of the small town of Ridgeway, they actually have a ghost on their police badge. So when you, you know, meet the police in Ridgeway, they actually have a little tiny ghost badge and I'll send pictures of that so you can share it with the audience. The ghost house just off of Highway 151 has long fallen over and, and gone to nothing. It was there for many, many years when I was a kid and I had to pass by it. But sometime in the 90s, it finally collapsed in on itself for good. And it lay as a pile of rubble for a couple of years before whoever owned the property finally got rid of the house. So there is no physical reminder of where the ghost possibly lived anymore. But when I was a kid, it used to scare me, you know, especially when we'd pass by it at night and the headlights would hit it and you'd see that spray painted home of ghost on it. And you'd wonder, you know, is he still there? The Ridgeway Phantom is still around, some people would say. It says it tends to work in cycles of 40 years. So every 40 years or so, it kind of shows back up and makes itself known. Uh, the last cycle that I can think of that actually had a lot of really good reports coming out of it was the 1970s, which basically meant that 20, I think 2010s or so should have been 
the next cycle, but I, I never heard any stories about the ghosts' activities then. The most recent stories that I can find of the actual Ridgeway Phantom date back to about 1993, and that's the same year I graduated from high school. So it's possible that the Phantom is finally gone or that people have just stopped telling stories about it. But at the same time, it's still a cool hometown legend. There's a lot of things going on in Wisconsin in general, just out of the paranormal. You can find out more about the Ridgeway Phantom in a wonderful book called Haunted Wisconsin by an author named Michael Norman. It's a book that I read religiously as a kid and still to this day really enjoy. But yeah, that's the, uh, the hometown legend I wanted to share. Keep up the good work. We'll see you down the road. Thanks, Sean. You know, I love a town that embraces their paranormal history. And by the way, I've linked two pictures of both the water tower and the police patch there in Ridgeway over in the show notes. So go visit the website and have a look. And thanks again, Sean. Something tells me this isn't the last that we'll hear about Ridgeway and the ghostly legends up that way. But we do appreciate the introduction. Now, folks, before we finish this thing up, I must remind you that we will be, for the most part, dark until we return for Season 15 on March 30th. So that means you still have a couple weeks to get any paranormal workers slash investigators slash expert stories in for the Paranormal Investigator Special. If you have a story, call our hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT and say that this is for our Paranormal Investigator Special. I'll use my fancy little search tool and find your entry and escort it politely to the front of the line. And in the meantime, I'll be releasing a few Patreon episodes over the break. So, if those are new to you, then be sure to keep your eye out for those episodes. And you know, while I'm announcing, with a little luck, we will have some release information on our upcoming film, Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness in the Borrego Triangle, when we return for Season 15. Now, we're meeting with distributors now, so it's only a matter of time. And unfortunately, this leg of the adventure is completely out of my hands. But like I've been saying, thank you all for the patience, and I think you'll be happy when you finally get to see it. Now, your patience will be required here no longer, because it's time to share another call. And this one, coincidentally, is our last one, so to speak. So to wrap up this hometown legend special, we end with a curse of sorts. Please welcome our anonymous caller from the state of Mississippi. Hey, Derek. I'm calling in to give you a hometown legend submission. I'm going to save my name but I will be giving some pretty specific names of places and and people who have long since passed. I think I failed to actually mention that this story comes from North Mississippi, Northeast Mississippi. Uh, If you Google Hatchie River, you'll see perhaps it's a very small creek or river uh, in Northeast Mississippi where all this is occurring. This is a story that my grandfather told me a lot growing up, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. He's since passed, but thankfully, my sister is a part of a middle school or high school English project or history project at one point wrote this story down straight from his mouth, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. He passed away in 2012, and you know the story sat in a PDF somewhere for years, and at one point I was going to write an extended short story based on this story and expand upon it a little bit. And in doing so, I was doing some research behind the actual person because I will be giving a real person's name. I found some really interesting backstory behind all of this. There's not a lot of detail there, but what I found was quite interesting, and I'll share that at the end. Without further ado, the story is titled The Legend of Hatchie Bottom, and it goes like this. Deep in the woods on the foothills of the Hatchie River, there once lived a lone man known by locals to have supernatural powers. He was a warlock by the name of Woodley Epps, and as it was told, he performed witchcraft. 
While in public in a crowd one day, he was boasting about his powers, and a man by the name of Miley Thomas seriously doubted that Mr. Epps had any witching powers whatsoever. The same night, Woodley Epps decided he would pay Miley a visit and make him a believer. Mr. Epps approached Miley's home around midnight and repeatedly called for Miley to come outside. Miley finally roused from his deep sleep and came to the door, and when he stepped off the porch to see what this foolish man wanted, in his sense, in the blink of an eye, Woodley Epps turned Miley into a mule, or a donkey. He got on the mule, he being Woodley Epps, he mounted the mule up and rode him down three miles to the edge of Hatchy Bottom to another man's turnip patch, who, who goes by the name Bolly Kellum. There, Woodley Epps hitched the mule, who was Miley Thomas, to a poplar tree while he gathered a sack of turnips. And so while Woodley Epps was gathering the turnips, Miley, who was still conscious, apparently, was able to think quickly and gnaw the bark off of the poplar tree that he was tied to. He thought that in order to prove this crazy thing was happening to him, he would come back the next day and see if the tree was actually gnawed on. And if not, he would know that he was just dreaming. So the story goes that the Miley, the guy who got turned into the mule, doesn't actually remember getting back home. Uh, he doesn't remember the journey home. But he wakes up the next morning in his bed, you know, probably pretty shocked, and he makes his way, you know, three miles back down the road on foot to go, uh, you know, see this poplar tree is not off. And of course, he's amazed because it's freshly gnawed off bark around the area where he was tied up to. And he could see the mule tracks in the field, in the turnip field from where he himself had been walking and where Woodley Epps had been walking. And in this story noted that Woodley's footprints were quite large. And the story is that from that day forward, Miley, of course, fully believed that Woodley Epps had witchcraft powers, and he, you know, of course, told everyone that he knew, and even showed people the tree that he had gnawed off. And that's the end of the story, and that's the story that I grew up hearing quite frequently. So, like I said, I went a few years ago and decided that I was going to take this childhood bedtime story that I'd been told my whole life and turn it into a short story. So I went to researching, again, I've said this man's name, Woodley Epps, so I googled the name Woodley Epps because it's a very unique name. It's spelled W-O-O-D-L-E-Y-E-P-P-S, first and last name, first name Woodley, last name Epps. Uh, so I went to Googling and I found something really interesting. I pulled up, by searching that name, of findagrave.com, uh, which is an online site that's in a sense kind of connected to the ancestry thing where people are able to list grave markers and where people were born and, and all of that. And from this search, I did find, interestingly, there was a man named Francis Woodley Epps who was buried in Bonham, Texas, which is in Fannin County. Uh, he was born in 1822 and died in 1900 at the age of 77. He was married to a Sarah Epps and had a child named William T. Epps, who has a little bit more of a detailed profile. He was born in 1859 in Alcorn County, Mississippi, which is where I'm describing the story from. And in fact, in his findagrave.com profile, you see a picture of him, and he's a pretty large guy. You see him standing next to a porch, and there's, it looks maybe like a daughter or a young lady sitting on a chair or uh, something on the porch. And I mean, he looks unless it's a you know trick of the eye and bad scaling because there's not a lot around him. He looks to be six feet tall or, or greater. And of course, William Epps passed away at age 86 and was buried in Wellington, Texas. So that's what I found interesting. That, you know, that my grandfather was a bit of a historian in a sense. He really enjoyed these things and he had a lot of other tales and paranormal things. He was never one to lie about anything like this uh, or even to recreate a story that he did not himself believe to be true. And it had gone out of my memory for the longest time until I started researching all of this. And while I did not necessarily disbelieve my grandfather to find this information on Find a Grave, to find that a man named Woodley Epps actually existed, that he had a son that was born in Corinth, which would have placed the man in the area that he was talking about and to find that he matched a description that came out of my grandfather's mouth, you know, 
from the early 1900s was pretty interesting. And the last thing that I'll add, I don't know how much credit I can really give this. I wish I could uh, message the person on Find a Grave. The member that uploaded this grave picture and information, and again, I don't know if this is worth giving too much credit to, but her profile name is Wiccan Witch. She does have, it seems like, thousands of uploads and, you know, accolades on this site. So I don't know that, you know, there's anything special about her name being, you know, Wiccan or Witch and him being a warlock or if there's any connection there. But I did find that pretty interesting. Her profile doesn't actually accept messages because I would love to know if she actually has any personal connection to this. Uh, But if anyone out there knows anyone from the Texas area with a last name Epps, E-P-P-S, or knows their ancestry that goes back to there, you know, please call in and tell your story. I I don't want to ever put in your mouth or put any bad stories out there that your ancestors were practicing witches or practicing warlocks, but um, that is the story that I've always heard my whole life, and the people were real. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for all you do, and I hope that you find this story to be useful. Bye-bye. Thank you, caller. It just goes to show you. Watch who you mess with, because you never know what people are capable of. Just ask old Miley Thomas. He always, he always says that. But you know, all this mountain curse talk is a good segue into my hometown legend for this evening. Now, although I still live in the Los Angeles area, for a decade there, I lived in and worked in the heart of LA. I lived in Mid-City and worked in Beverly Hills. We had a 90210 zip code and everything. And like most Angelinos, we did a lot of hiking in our free time. And a popular destination for our weekly Saturday morning jaunts was to the second largest park in California and one of the largest parks in the country. LA's infamous Griffith Park. Now originally the land was home to the Gabrielino Tongva people until Juan Bautista de Anza came through on his way to northern reaches. Soon after, Spaniards began settling the area, and the Spanish government gifted the land that the park sits on today to one of De Anza's soldiers all the way back in 1787. The recipient, José Vicente Feliz, developed and ranched the land. And after José's death, the family was swindled out of the property by a grifter named Antonio Coronel. Now when the last of the Feliz family, Petronilla Feliz, learned of the loss of land, she became instantly angry and placed a curse on anyone that would own it. And apparently, folks took and still take that curse seriously. Coronel was actually shook by the curse, and he ended up giving his share of the land to his lawyer, who died of a gunshot wound shortly thereafter. The property was sold to a man named Leon Lucky Baldwin, who worked on the land, but found that his cattle grew sick and his crops were struck with blight. Running out of money, Baldwin sold the land to the man who would become the park's namesake, Griffith J. Griffith. Griffith wanted to raise ostriches on the land. However, that didn't work out, and he shut down the ranch just four years later. In 1896, Griffith donated the cursed land to the city of Los Angeles. The curse may have lived on with the Griffith family, however, as in 1903, he shot his wife, Tina, in the face. She did live, and Griffith did serve a whole two years in jail. Once in public hands, the curse receded for a while, but in 1933, 29 civilian conservation corps workers died in a wildfire. The curse continued in 1976 with the death of a young couple who were crushed by a falling tree while making love on a picnic table. In 2012, a severed head was found on one of the park's hiking trails. In 2016, hikers found a human skull partially buried, and investigators determined that the skull had been in the park for at least a year. In 2019, park rangers found human remains wrapped in a blanket behind some brush. To this day, many hikers and park visitors swear they've encountered ghosts of those who have died in the park late at night. 
a bike clip property of LA in a minute over on YouTube, and perfectly illustrates all the terror that takes place in the park. And sure, it's a big park in a huge city, full of homeless encampments, cliffs, and coyotes. So maybe you expect to find a severed head or two from time to time. But there's absolutely no denying the spook factor of the park. Especially if you find yourself there after dark. I have, and I can attest to it being unsettling. And folks, that is my hometown legend for the episode. And the end of your season 14 finale episode. I hope you enjoyed season 14. We sure had a lot of fun putting it together. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited for season 15. Big spooky things are in store. And we hope you come back to join us on the adventure. And of course... Thanks for taking the ride thus far. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Eddie Lloyd. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Please do me a solid and leave us a rate and review wherever that sort of thing is possible. And while you're at it, follow us over at YouTube. A like and follow will go a long way to help that channel grow. Lastly, be sure to keep up with us on our social media accounts for, for news and announcements. Our moderators work very hard to supply a safe and creative space for us to share stories. And finally this evening, the terrifying score that you heard. Well, that was Iron Cthulhu Apocalypse. Co.ag Music and Carl Casey and White Bat Audio. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for an incredible season 14. You keep it spooky out there. And I'll catch you guys next time. Tonight's secret entry is a little bit different. Back on Hometown Legend number 13, you may recall a story sent in by Wendy in Oklahoma about a spooky creek in Osage County called Doga Creek. Well, according to Wendy, all sorts of strange activity goes on there, from ghostly hitchhikers and UFOs to large hairy beasts hiding in the trees. Well, Tom, from the very same area, has called in with his own unique perspective. Hi, Derek. This is Tom Ashmore. I'm calling in for a possible hometown legend submission. I'm Osage Native American, and I live seven miles west of a town called Fairfax, Oklahoma. On the way out to my house, I'm from Fairfax. There's a creek called Doga Creek, D-O-G-A. And in my language, that means victory. There's always been stories. My grandfather told my mom that that's where our people took down the last monster. There's always been stories, even uh, more modern stories, of all kinds of cryptids and things that have uh, happened around this creek. So it's, it's a little stretch of creek that goes into the Arkansas River, and lots of spooky things have happened. So anyways, I came up with this song. I tried to get this song in before the five-minute mark, but here it goes. Young men ran back 
drowning high in the old man's game Boy, run for your life And the young man, he looked down the bank of that creek Oh, he knew he was dying, but he couldn't see So he took a step closer He couldn't hardly stand The sight of those eyes, it was a big hairy man And you don't go down to Doggy Creek at night Cause the big hairy man, he's gonna take your life Goodbye That was The Ballad of Doga Creek by Tom Ashmore. Any link to the full tune can be found in tonight's show notes. I will admit, it's pretty catchy. It's been in my head all week. So great work, Tom. And thank you for calling in. Well, folks, this is where the party ends. But there's always an after party. So join us on Monsters Among Us Beyond over at Patreon.com by searching Monsters Among Us Podcast and joining that $5 level or higher. Once you do, you'll receive instant access to the rest of these hometown legends and days and days worth of additional content, just like what you're hearing in the main feed. So what are you waiting for? Visit the Beyond today, where you'll hear great entries like this monster submission by Maria in California. Hi there, this is Maria calling in from Southern California in the Antelope Valley. The hometown legend that I wanted to share really quick was my dad grew up in Puebla, Mexico, where Nahuales, they're sort of these skinwalker, shapeshifter creatures. They're kind of well known there. And he always told me,